In this video, we're going to be looking at ideas of internal energy and temperature. Now, by the end of this, you're going to need to be able to define internal energy, differentiate between internal energy and temperature, describe the motion and energies of molecules in solids, liquids and gases, and convert between the Celsius and absolute temperature scales. Now, if we're looking at ideas of energy and internal energy, we need to think about ways in which we can transfer energy between objects. Now, there are two main methods that you can transfer energy. One is through thermal energy transfer. Thermal energy moving from a hotter to a colder region due to the difference in temperature between two objects. Another way that we can transfer energy between objects is by having an object do work on another object. For example, here the car is doing work on the caravan fairly successfully by pulling it along. So those are the two ways that we can transfer heat, or at least transfer energy between them. Now we're going to look at what we mean by internal energy. The definition, and it's a wordy one, is that the internal energy of an object is the sum of the distribution of the kinetic and potential energies of its molecules due to their individual movements and positions. Basically, it is just the sum of all of the energies of all of the molecules inside an object or a system. But you do need to learn this full wordy definition. A good example of uh, internal energy changes is with brake pads. When you apply the brake pads to a wheel, the pads will squeeze onto the wheel. You get frictional forces between the pad and the wheel, which causes thermal energy to be gained within the wheel and the pads from the kinetic energy of the vehicle. Since you have a gain in the thermal energy and therefore the kinetic energy of the individual molecules, the internal energy is increasing. Now that makes it sound like internal energy and temperature are effectively the same thing, but be careful, that's not always the case. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a system. And so yes, by raising the temperature of an object, you raise its internal energy. But there are other ways that you can do that as well. For example, magnetizing an object or moving the individual molecules away if they're being attracted by some kind of electrostatic charge will increase the potential energies as well. And remember, our internal energy is a sum of the potential and kinetic energies. Now, our internal energy will change any time we have heat being transferred in or out of the system or any time work is being done on the object as long as the energy into the system is greater or less than the energy out. If the energy being transferred into the system is balanced out by the energy being transferred out, then there'll be no change in internal energy. A good example of uh, looking at the changes in internal energy is with a light bulb. If I start the video, and the video starts just as the current gets switched on. As the current is switched on, I'm doing work on the filament. Electrical work is being done. Now its initial internal energy wouldn't be zero. The filament's molecules will be vibrating. But as I do work through running a current through my filament, the internal energy of my light bulb is going to increase. As the internal energy increases, the kinetic energy of my molecules is increasing until we get to this point here where I get a nice steady glow on the filament. That steady glow is showing me that I'm not getting an increase in the thermal properties and that's because while I am doing work on the system, therefore I'm increasing the temperature, at this point here I also have thermal energy being radiated outwards. And that thermal energy is equal to the energy I am putting in through doing work and increasing the kinetic energy of the molecules in the filament. So, while the energy in is equal to the energy out, I get constant internal energy. If I were then to turn the light bulb off, I remove this work done aspect, I'm still radiating energy to the environment, and therefore 
my filament is going to be losing internal energy. We also need to think about changes of state and solids, liquids and gases in terms of their temperature and in terms of what's going on with their internal energies. Now if we take a look at this little animation here, initially I have a solid. You can see that my particles are moving around, they are vibrating and they're moving in a random manner. So they have a random movement and they are vibrating about a fixed point. But they are still very much anchored within their little realms by electrostatic attraction. So they're held by electrostatic attraction. Now as I heat up my solid, the vibration of the individual molecules will increase. As the vibration increases, their kinetic energy increases and we see this as a raise in temperature until eventually I get the molecules vibrating so much they can start to separate out or effectively the solid changes state into a liquid. Now when it changes state the temperature is remaining constant but I'm still putting energy into the system. Where's that energy going? Well I'm increasing the potential energy of my molecules because they're spreading further apart and since they're attracted to each other electrostatically by increasing the distance I'm increasing the potential energy. So my molecules in a liquid are still moving randomly but no fixed point is observed. So they're moving around, they're still held by an electrostatic repulsion or attraction even, sorry, but it's much weaker than it was for a solid. As I heat it once again, the vibrations increase, so the kinetic energy increases, which means the temperature is increasing. Until eventually the temperature increases so much that more and more of the molecules are able to break away completely from the rest of the bunch and I get a change of state into a gas. And once again, while I'm getting that change of state, the temperature is remaining constant over that change of state period, but the potential energy of my molecules is increasing. Finally, my gas has got random motion, but much further apart. And from here on out, as I add kinetic energy to the system, once all of the liquid has turned into a gas, all I observe is the internal energy increasing through an increase in temperature. There's no other change of state for us to observe within normal laboratory conditions. So a quick recap, having looked at what we've looked at there, the internal energy of our object is the sum of the distribution of the kinetic and potential energies of its molecules due to their individual movements and positions. So it's a combination of the potential and the kinetic energies, and remember the average kinetic energy of an object is its temperature, or rather of the molecules within the object. Now we need to have a quick look at temperature and scales, remembering of course that heat will always travel from hot to cold, 
and if there's no difference in temperature between two objects or if they are in thermal equilibrium then no heat transfer will take place at all. Now the scale that we commonly use in the lab is the Celsius scale. It's based on the boiling point and the freezing point of water where of course its ice point is 0 degrees C and the vapour point is 100 degrees C. But increasingly in physics we use the Kelvin scale or the absolute scale. Now the absolute scale is the scale that you will use for the majority of the calculations that you do in any of the thermal and gas physics. And the absolute scale takes its reference point from the very coldest possible temperature that could be. That is the point at which the molecules in an object will have zero kinetic energy. And we call that point absolute zero. Now if you're using that point as the zero on our scale, then it turns out that the ice point, which is normally in the Celsius scale 0 degrees C, occurs at a temperature of 273.15 Kelvin, or if you look at this chart combining them at the bottom here, 0 degrees Kelvin is minus 273.15 degrees C, and 0 degrees C is 273.15 Kelvin. So to convert between them, if I want to get the temperature in degree C from a temperature in Kelvin, all I do is take my temperature in Kelvin and subtract that 273 degree, uh, 273 Kelvin from my temperature. Let's have a quick practice at that then. What would 10.4 degrees C be in Kelvin? Well, I know that 0 degrees C occurs at 273 Kelvin, so I know that uh, 10.4 degrees C is going to be much higher in Kelvin. It's going to be 10.4 plus 273.15 Kelvin, which gives me a temperature of 283.55 Kelvin. What about the other way, going from Kelvin to degree C? Well, 322 Kelvin is just minus my 273.15, which gives me an answer in Celsius of 48.85 degrees C. Now there's a link between the pressure of a gas and its temperature and we'll see this later on when we look at the gas laws. But absolute zero can be determined if you look at the pressure of two different gases at two identical temperatures. In this case here the ice point or 0 degrees C and the boiling point of 100 degrees C. Or at least that would, is what it would be for water. Now assuming that we're keeping the volumes constant, as you heat up a gas, it will expand. But if you're keeping the volume constant, it's going to try to expand your increase in the kinetic energies, the pressure's going to rise. And so for the hotter gas, we get a higher pressure. If you join two points on a pressure temperature scale, for one gas and two points on a pressure temperature scale at the same points for a different gas, where they cross over gives you absolute zero. So that's about it for internal energy and temperature. Remember you need to be able to define the internal energy as the sum of the individual potential and kinetic energies of an of the molecules in an object due to their position and movement, differentiate between internal energy and temperature, describe the motion and energies of molecules in solids, liquids and gases, and convert between the Celsius and absolute temperature scales.